Okay, so I think we're making a lot of progress in giving you guys the basic idea. The questions were, were pretty precise on, on kind of how do I manage these different kinds of characters? And that's, that's the whole point, okay? I think with this little interlude about a bird description, maybe the best point I can make or the most useful point that I can make to you is that there's also an element of style in there, um, which is to say if you write a very bare bones description in the bird world, people will be um, pretty confused. Like Rayfew had a paper that was 32 new species of Platymantis frogs, or how many was it? That's the result. Okay, haven't published the paper yet. He's been working on it for like 10 years. Okay, 20. Um, so there are def definitely differences in style. And remember, there are kind of two levels here. One is that you're doing your very best to meet all of the conditions of the code. But the other is you have to get by the reviewers, okay? Your peer reviewers to get it published in that journal. So it not only has to make that minimum, minimum criterion of the code, but it also has to be sufficient to meet the, um, the requirements of your colleagues. So I just want to go fairly quickly through a description uh, of a new species of bird. And this is something that Mark and I, one of the students in the Division of Ornithology and a Peruvian colleague of ours, uh, just described uh, two years ago from central Peru. And without a doubt of the, of the four major groups that we are going to give you examples of uh, between plants, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, Birds probably have the fewest new species left to find, and so we make the biggest um, uh, party around discovering a new species. Um, so the papers tend to be longer and more detailed and such. It probably is unnecessary. We really probably should be focused on getting these species described more quickly. Anyhow, uh, let me give you the example. So a new species of Cytolopus tapaculo from the Andes of central Peru. Um, the abstract and such, well, you're gonna see a more extensive introduction than you've seen or will see in these, in these other papers. But there's some useful things in here. Cytolopus tapaculos are tracheophone subossines. Okay, that's ornithology speak for kind of one small part of a big radiation of birds. In fact, one part of one small part of a big radiation of birds. And so remember what Dave was talking about, about defining the universe of taxa to which you are going to compare. Okay, right away by saying Cytolopus, we're reducing our universe, okay? So there's a lot in here about, about Cytolopus, and they're kind of the nightmare taxon within birds because they basically are birds that wanted to become mice. And so they're all about this big, and they're all kind of steel gray or blackish gray. There's very little in the world of Cytolopus that is distinctive or kind of easy to diagnose. So this gets us into the realm that, that Caleb brought up, uh, where what do you do if there just aren't any characters? So um, one point that we made that Mark has made over his whole career, Systematics of Cytolopus has benefited from the advent of portable, high quality recording equipment. And that ends up being crucial to this species. It's really identifiable best by its voice. Uh, and then we provide some pretty crucial information about the place and the local Cytolopus fauna. So six species of Cytolopus are known from the east slope of the Andes in Junin province, Peru. So right away we're saying in this region, there's a, we, we know of six species. And in the Andes, you have very complex elevational gradients and very complex elevational trends um, and a lot of turnover of species from one elevation to the next. 
And so uh, these Cytolopus almost exclusively sort out in different elevations. So that's, that's just kind of the background. And you're going to see this is really developed as a full paper, not just as a species description like Dr. Peggy showed us. Um, so methods, and there's all this detail of where we did our sampling and how we did our sampling. There's a map, and so here's Peru. And within Peru, our site was right there. And so here's a blow up of that. Here's Junin province, and here are all of the sites that, that are mentioned in the text. Um, you can see, this is a little bit out of order, but you can see an illustration, in this case a, a photograph, or two photographs, of the holotype. And you can see it's basically blackish gray. There's not much to distinguish it based on its plumage. There's also, by the way, a painting of this species and it's placed among other similar species. So the painting is designed to help with the diagnosis, but not substitute for it. And then the other thing that we do in the bird world is we kind of give a little bit of, of narration. So four specimens were collected. Um, we evaluated the, um, you're essentially narrating through that process of deciding that it's a new species. Um, and so the results, again, it, it's sounding like a full scientific paper. And this first, pa this first paragraph of the results say, vocalizations, plumage, morphometrics, and genetic evidence indicate that the series of four Cytolopus specimens in the Rio Satipo Valley represent an undescribed species, diagnosable from all other recognized species along the elevational gradient in Hunin, that's one definition of our universe, from the allopatric Cytolopus latrans complex, that's another dimension of our universe, and from one central Peruvian taxon not currently recognized as a species, but which has a validly introduced name. So what were we doing? We didn't want to do all of Cytolopus. We didn't need to go that far although there'll be little mentions of all of Cytolopus in the text, it's got a lot of species in it. So instead, we essentially defined our universe of comparison right there, okay? And then here we go, Cytolopus gettii. Now, that journal does not include in its, in its um, style the Spanov, okay? That's a little curious. We give it an English name, a Spanish name, and you're going to see all the same pieces as you just saw with Dave. Here's a very detailed description of the holotype. And what I'd like you to notice is that the holotype's description, this is actually describing the data that come with the specimen. But then, audio recordings of the holotype are archived at, and we give the catalog number, um, and tissue samples are and the syrinx was preserved. So we're saying here are all of the pieces of the holotype. And in fact, let's see, that should be four. this one. C, that is the holotype's song. So we're giving you uh, sound spectrograms. So this tells you exactly and precisely which specimen is the holotype. Then we go in and describe the holotype. And this gets back to some of the questions earlier. Um, it's an adult male. It has no bursa of Fabricius. And the bursa of Fabricius is an indicator of youth. Okay? And so this makes us quite clear that this is a fully adult individual. So that was up to here, that was the, the description of the holotype. But then we get into the diagnosis of the taxon. So look at this. Right away we're going to reduce our universe from all of life to the genus Cytolopus. Cytolopus gettii is a typical Cytolopus in general morphology with a percolate nares, small sharp bill, medium small size, blah, 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 blah. Boom, we've gone from tens of thousands of species 
to under 100, okay? We then start reducing and reducing that universe, okay? And I'll give you an example of where you can go wrong with this. The first species I ever was involved with describing was a swift, like the one that we got earlier in the course, um, different genus. And it was all over dusky black, but right here on the forehead, just above the bill, it had kind of a frosting of gray-white. And that was really the defining character and is the defining character of that species still. Well, I was looking at all the swift specimens. It's a very rare genus. I was looking at all the specimens that I could find. I found nothing that had the frosting above the bill. And I looked, okay, let's check against all the swifts, just to be sure. So that was gene, our, our species was genus Cypsiloides. But I'm looking in genus Kaitura, and I see in the synonymy of a Kaitura, I see a taxon Cypsiloides griziofrons. And I thought, there it is. Somebody picked out this taxon before. That's got to be it. Griziofrons, gray fronted. So the, the holotype, it was known only from the holotype. The holotype was um, in the University of Michigan. And so I planned the trip to Michigan just to look at this single specimen. And it was very funny what I found. The description of Cypsiloides griziofrons said, differs from all other Cypsiloides in having a gray front, a gray frosting above the bill. I thought, that's my bird, right? So why was this thing synonymized? And it was synonymized under a taxon in a different genus, in the genus Kaitura. So I get the holotype in my hand, I look at it, it's a Kaitura. So what had happened was, the person who described it got the swift in hand, couldn't identify it, looked at it, said, oh yeah, that's a Cypsiloides, compared it with all the other Cypsiloides, found no other Cypsiloides like it, described it, differentiated it from all other Cypsiloides, but forgot to differentiate it from the next genus over. And indeed, he had described a normal specimen of some Kaitura swift. Oops, you just got synonymized. Okay, luckily our bird was Cypsiloides, also had a gray front, and is now considered a valid taxon. Anyhow, that's a cautionary tale. So we have our diagnosis in terms of plumage and morphology. We have a diagnosis in terms of voice. I'm going to jump over the table because it's a little out of order. We have discussion and description of the paratypes. Very important because all of these specimens initially were, um, well, the holotype must be returned to Peru. And so it was very important that we provide some comparative information about specimens that would be in Peru and specimens that would be in the US. Um, and so we, do, we don't have a female of the species, but at least we have in paratype three a subadult male. And then here's the, the etymology where we, we uh, describe essentially our reasoning and naming this after Caroline Marie Getty. Um, Specimen material examined. This is really critical because this says, I took my holotype and I held it up next to all of these taxa. And that suggests that I have differentiated it from all of these other taxa, okay? So that's kind of the crucial ingredients of the description. But then we are also, and there's some, there's uh, morphometric information on the previous page and sound spectrograms on this page. But now in the discussion, we can go into more detail. 
on some of these points. Just things that we ought to be considering. Cytolopus are so hard to work on, because they're all alike, that we decided we needed to, to discuss variation within the type series, which is to say, are you sure that all four of those specimens belong to the same species? Better be sure before you, before you uh, describe it. Female plumage is unknown, but here's where we, we talk about the variation from holotype to paratype to paratype to paratype. We talk about the distribution, and this is pretty interesting because it's, our, our species is known from only one valley on the eastern slope of the Andes. We talk about its systematic relationships, which is pretty short. We did do the sequencing to make sure that we had this placed properly, but it's pretty short because some colleagues in another country are working on a very detailed species level phylogeny. And we did not want to um, you know, cause confusion with them. We got in communication with them. They helped us to figure out where our taxon was placed, but we're not gonna publish a full phylogeny of the group because that'll be done much better soon. Habitat, ecology, and behavior, and this is where we go back to those six species that are arrayed along the elevational gradient. So for example, there was slight overlap at elevations of 2,400 to 2,500 meters where Gettii, Femoralis, and Macropus were all heard from the same point. Okay, so we're essentially pointing out not just with what species is this form sympatric, but also with, it, with what species is it syntopic, which is to say the same ecosystem, the same habitat. Um, so that's just kind of ecological detail. And then, as Dave mentioned earlier, we come back to conservation implications. We say, hey, this species is known from two places on Earth that are five kilometers apart. So its range is minuscule. But we say, in theory, this would qualify the species for listing as endangered by the IUCN because its known range is so small. However, this species is difficult to detect and occurs in a poorly surveyed region. So we believe it will eventually be found elsewhere in Junin and perhaps more widely in central Peru. Ah. We're being careful about not over-interpreting information. It may best be termed data deficient until more information is available. We have no information on population size or population trends. Okay? And then we try our very best to acknowledge every person who made any contribution to this effort, and that ranges from other curators who provided access to material, it ranges to other experts who helped us check the identification of the songs. Um, a group in Lima that provided funding and support, et cetera, et cetera. All of our field companions, essentially all of that is, is acknowledged there. And references. So as, as research papers go, it's short. But as species descriptions go compared to what you'll hear about for herpetology and plants, it's actually long. And again, that's because there aren't that many new species of birds out there to find still. Okay? So again, we make a bigger party of it than the herpers do or, you know, worse yet, entomologists where it's, you know, common. <laughs>